Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and uh, staying somewhere warm and inside. It's pretty snowy and there's a mix of sleet and freezing rain here right now, so not the best day to be doing anything outside. Um, so yeah, the focus of our conversation today is creating a green bank to improve options for financing clean energy in Maine. Um, I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, hopefully you know which tribe or tribes lived in your area. Um, where, where I am, this is primarily Wabanaki land um, and we're pretty close to Penobscot land. You know, it's hard to say exactly who was where. I'm sure, I know they all moved around a lot, um, but you know, it's important to acknowledge those who came before us um, who we've stolen the land from. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about me. I, I studied civil and environmental engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And then I worked for three years in construction management in Connecticut and New Jersey. Um, and I decided to transition career and moved to Reno, Nevada to work for a nonprofit teaching middle school and high school students about energy efficiency and clean energy. And I built a whole energy efficiency curriculum and led both in school lessons with students as well as professional development workshops with more than 50 students, or with more than 50 teachers over the course of uh, about five years. And then I worked for the Nevada Governor's Office of Energy where I led energy efficiency programs statewide ranging from uh, weatherization of homes for low income seniors to helping cities, counties, and school districts implement multi-million dollar self-funding efficiency projects. Um, I moved back to Maine in 2017 and I've been working for Revision Energy as a designer, designing heat pumps and solar systems uh, for a little over three years now. And I've transitioned two houses entirely off of fossil fuels. Um, we transitioned our home in Reno to net zero energy and our house in Maine, which is an old post and beam farmhouse built in 1828. Um, I turned on the boiler over the weekend for the first time in three years, just to make sure it still works. And otherwise we've been heating entirely with heat pumps. Um, our solar array doesn't quite offset all of our uh, electricity usage, but I think we're about 70% uh, self uh, powered with our solar array. And we've done a lot of efficiency improvements as well. Um, so I have a lot of firsthand experience uh, with transitioning homes off of fossil fuels to clean energy. Um, so before we start talking about the Green Bank, um, I wanted to bring up another bill that is scheduled for a hearing next week. I've been working with Representative Maggie O'Neill on LD99, which calls for divesting the public employee retirement system from fossil fuels. Um, I have added up their holdings and identified what I consider to be fossil fuel companies. And they have over a billion dollars in fossil fuel investments. And that's down from one, about $1.2 billion a year ago. And, um, and that's due to them losing in the market over the last year. Um, and the bill hearing is scheduled for next Wednesday, February 10th at 11 a.m. Um, and I'd encourage all of you to submit testimony in support of the bill. And if you don't want to try to give uh, in-person testimony during the hearing, um, written testimony can be submitted online prior to the hearing. Um, and I'll share a link in the chat that um, has a lot more information about how to submit written testimony as well as some example testimony drafted. The key thing um, is to say that you're a Maine resident. If you were a public employee at any point or part of the public employee retirement system, it's really important to acknowledge that. And, and then to say whatever you want in regards to why you think it's important for them to divest from fossil fuels and uh, and then encourage them to support the bill. Uh, but the more testimony that goes in in advance of the hearing, um, the, the more likely it is to, to pass. 
So I want to encourage all of you to do that. And also it's kind of a great warm up if there's other bills that you're excited about, like the Green Bank bill, it's good to practice working through their system and, and know what to do. So as a legislative session gets going faster, um, it, it'll be a less complicated process for you. And um, so to me, the primary reason to divest from fossil fuels is because they're a terrible investment. Um, the, the public employee retirement system has over a billion dollars invested in fossil fuels, and that's basically flatlined and actually decreased in the last 10 years. Um, even leading up to prior to the pandemic, ignoring the effect that the pandemic and the recession have had on the fossil fuel industry, as of uh, December of 2019, um, the fossil fuel industry was down about 20% compared to 10 years before. And at that same time, the S&P 500 had risen over 150% over that same time period. So if that billion dollars had been invested in just the rest of the stock market in general, um, it would have it would have created an additional billion and a half dollars uh, in returns for the retirement system. Um, and so they've literally lost out on over a billion dollars by maintaining these investments in fossil fuels. And it's really just sad and disappointing to me because there was a big push in 2014 and they and the public employee retirement system said, oh no, we need to we need to have the ability, it's our fiduciary responsibility to be able to invest in fossil fuels. Uh, we don't know where the market's gonna go. No one can say where the market's gonna go. And it could be really good for us. And it's been terrible. And it's cost a billion dollars for the retirees of the state, in addition to continuing to fund the, the climate problem um, nationwide and globally. Um, and looking ahead, we know that there's no future for the fossil fuel industry. Um, 189 countries have signed on to the Paris Climate Accord. Um, we're rapidly transitioning to electric vehicles and heat pump systems and away from oil, heating oil and, and gasoline powered vehicles. And numerous cities, counties and states have made clean energy commitments. Um, and so the fossil fuel industry is waning and they're never gonna be posting the same levels of profits. I know that 10 years ago, there were several years where Exxon Mobil was the most profitable company in the world. Well, last year they lost half their value. Um, so they're just not good investments. And it's important for you know, the future of the retirees in Maine to transition off of them. So again, um, I hope you'll click on that link in the chat and uh, provide some testimony in support of this bill. It's really important for the future of the retirement system and for the future of a habitable planet. Um, so transitioning to the Green Bank, um, the key question many of you probably have is what is a Green Bank? Um, and there's a number of examples around the country and around the world. Um, and it's typically a public or nonprofit institution that uses public funding to leverage additional investment from private lenders into the clean energy sector. And so a green bank will partner with local banks, local credit unions, and other lenders to leverage their private investment, which creates a multiplier effect. Um, I'll talk more about some other green banks in a bit, but often they can leverage five to 10 times more private investment than the public capital. So for instance, a $100 million investment can leverage 500 million to a billion dollars in private investment. So it's, it's meant to accelerate the, the clean energy transition um, and by partnering with, with other local lenders. And, and so to me, the real problem with efficiency and clean energy, um, I've been working in this sector for more than a decade now. And we know that these projects will pay for themselves typically within 10 years, some much faster, some take a little bit longer but the project will pay for itself through the long-term energy savings. 
Um, but many, many families across Maine and around the country can't afford the upfront costs. Um, if, you, if you need to spend 10 or $15,000 for efficiency improvements in your house and 20 or $30,000 for a solar array to provide all your electricity, if you don't have any substantial savings, then you don't have the money to invest. And most lenders require a certain income level. They're looking at your loan to income ratio. And so if you don't have enough income, then you're not eligible for a loan. If you have poor credit, then you're not eligible for a loan. Um, and many low income families across the state um, lack equity in their homes or, or the sufficient savings to be able to move forward. And so there's, uh, I would estimate that 50% of the households in Maine have, have very little ability to participate in efficiency and clean energy or fund these types of projects in their homes. And while Efficiency Maine has some incredible programs and offers great rebates, um, if you get a $1,000 rebate on a $5,000 project, you still have to be able to afford the other $4,000 of it. Um, and so there's still a lot of households that, that aren't able to participate. Um, so two years ago, I started working with Representative Ziegler, who, who represents me here in, in Morrill. He represents Morrill, Montville, Liberty, and a handful of other towns, Lincolnville. Um, and we, I worked with him to draft LD 1634, and act to create the Maine Clean Energy Fund um, and that bill called for $100 million in bond funding from the state, um, which is a really big lift. It's a, it's a tough bill to pass. Um, it was carried forward. Um, it was carried forward to the following session last year. And then the session was ended prematurely due to the pandemic. And so the bill um, died in committee, um, like so many other bills from last year. Um, but we have used the, that time to really uh, build up support for the Green Bank over the last year, last couple of years. So we're in a very posi different position than we were a year ago. Um, there's not a bill number yet this year, um, but the bill is submitted to the revisor's office. Uh, Representative Ziegler is the primary sponsor again, and the lead co-sponsor is Senator Mark Lawrence, who is co-chair of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, which is where the bill was heard last year. Um, we have support, we have general support from Michael Stoddard. I think he's limited by the, the gov right now the governor's office is neither supporting nor opposing the bill. Um, and I think he's constrained by, by them. And so he hasn't, he hasn't come outright in support of it, but we'll see what happens as the session gets started as a, as a bill moves forward but I've participated in a number of calls with him and, and he helped me to redraft the bill this year so that it will fit under Efficiency Maine. And then um, Henry Beck, the Maine State Treasurer is in support of this. And he spoke on a lunch and learn that we hosted in December. Um, and so much stronger support than we've had um, in, the, in the past. Um, and, and like I mentioned, we, I, I worked with Michael Stoddard at Efficiency Maine to redraft the bill so that it will create a new initiative under Efficiency Maine. Uh, this year, we're not calling for any bonds or state funding, which makes passing the bill a lot easier. Um, bills that require funding have to go through the Appropriations Committee and also require a two-thirds vote to pass. And so now, without, any, without requesting any state funding, um, we don't need to go through the Appropriations Committee, and it's just a simple majority vote to pass the bill. Um, and so that significantly increases the chances um, and, and makes it a much easier um, bill to, to move forward. Um, we are expecting funding from the National Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator, also called the National Climate Bank, um, which I'll get into in, in a lot more detail later. Um, and I've already mentioned how this will leverage private capital from local banks, credit unions, and, and other lenders here in Maine. Um, I don't want to linger too much. This it tends to get pretty technical. Um, these are the types of investments that the uh, Clean Energy Accelerator um, can invest in, um, and so they can take on debt um, in projects. 
Um, the big thing is offering credit enhancements or a loan loss reserve and loan guarantees. Um, so that would be like essentially setting $10 million aside and using that as a pool for any projects that default. So other local lenders have a reduced risk in, in investing in these types of projects because the loan loss reserve um, will limit the, the defaults on their projects. And so by reducing the risk for other lenders, it allows them to lower their interest rates and makes it easier for them to participate in, in the new market. And um, the Michigan Saves is a, is a green bank style program in the state of Michigan that's been around for about 10 years. And they created a loan loss reserve. That's essentially the only thing that they do is they operate the loan loss reserve. And they've partnered with a number of credit unions across the state. And they've been able to leverage their initial investment 30 to one. So a uh, $100 million investment becomes $3 billion in projects. Um, and, and so it's a very powerful tool um, for working with other lenders and, and for reducing the risk on, on projects. Um, the, the green bank will be able to aggregate and warehouse loans together. So that would be taking, you know, if a hundred projects are completed, they can bundle them together and resell them on the secondary market, which provides that capitalization again, so that they have more money to be able to loan out. Um, there's a, it, it basically creates a lot of different tools that allow them to fund projects and then recapture that funding from other from other sources other lenders and be able to make loans again and again and again because the faster it can cycle through the the funding the more projects get invested and every time they invest in new projects there's the ability to leverage more private capital and so it can really move things forward very quickly in the in the place um, and and then they can also invest in any other financial product approved by the board of efficiency Maine, um, and so that gives them additional leeway these these first four investment types are all proven by other green banks around the country and around the world um, but as new tools and new approaches are developed um, we want them to have the ability to uh, adapt without having to go to the legislature every time there's there's something new that they want to do um, and this bill specifically directs 40% of funding to vulnerable communities in Maine. So that includes low-income communities, uh, low-income households, and communities of color. Um, and, and so that provides a strong equity piece to this legislation um, to, to help make sure that those who have been left behind by the clean energy transition to date, those who have been most negatively affected by fossil, the fossil fuel industry, um, are, are being helped and you know it's not just going to middle and upper income households. Um, so we've we've been working um, for six or nine months now to really build statewide support for this. Um, I, I led a Maine Green Bank Summit in June last year and we had over 100 attendees. We had about 120 attendees for a lunch and learn event in December. Um, and we've had various meetings with specific um, industries in Maine. We met with the Maine Bankers Association, Credit Union League, and a handful of lenders um, in January. And we have a follow-up meeting tomorrow where we're trying to get the Bankers Association to commit to supporting the bill. Um, right now, it sounds like they don't have any objections, uh, but we're, we're trying to get them to advocate in support of it um, and, and have the most support that we can. We have a whole array of environmental groups that are supportive, including Sierra Club and 350 Maine have really been leading efforts in the state. Um, and then the Environmental Priorities Coalition, which is made up of 32 environmental and nonprofit groups, uh, has made this one of their priorities for this legislative session. Uh, and so support from environmental community in Maine. Um, Revision Energy is backing this bill and we're, we're working on bringing other clean energy companies on board. Uh, realtors, contractors, and architects, uh, both the cities of Portland and South Portland are supportive. Um, and I think that this week 
it's looking really likely that the Portland Chamber of Commerce will support this bill. Um, so very unique, you know, in, in what is, you know, primarily an environmental climate bill uh, to have a broad support from the business community as well. Um, so quickly looking at the, the types of impact that this can have, um, in 2019, the Connecticut Green Bank invested almost $41 million in public capital. They leveraged that by almost nine to one. So they brought in $300 million in private capital. Um, these investments together generated almost 18 million in state tax revenues, created 3,300 jobs. In, in 2019 alone, the Connecticut Green Bank funded 7,600 residential solar installations. Uh, in Maine, in the same time period, um, there were less than, uh, there, I think there were less than 2,000 solar arrays installed in Maine in that same time period. So the Connecticut Green Bank is funding far more solar than the current solar industry in Maine is currently installing. Um, and all that equates to over a million tons in, in CO2 savings from the projects that they've that they've funded. Um, and they've been able to create in Connecticut as they've been as they, they've had successful programs, they've been able to dial in and recognize specific gaps in the marketplace. Um, for instance, they recognized that they they were weren't having as much participation from low income communities and specifically communities of color. And they created a program that specifically targets those communities. And, and they've had a lot of success in installing solar on low income houses in communities of color um, in, in the state. Um, so a tremendous opportunity to direct a, a investment uh, into the homes, into the businesses that need it the most. So for the main green bank, there's several potential funding sources. Um, the National Climate Bank, uh, uh oh, um, the National Climate Bank is the most likely one to move forward. Um, we're not requesting any bond funding this year. Um, if the National Climate Bank doesn't move forward, isn't fully funded, um, then we'll try to pursue other funding options moving forward. The bill leaves it open so it can receive funding from other sources. Um, but at this point, we don't wanna, we know that the state budget is, is definitely strapped due to the pandemic. Um, and there's lots of other priorities that they're looking at bond funding for. Um, so we're not trying to do that. Um, it can receive funding from nonprofits or, or foundation grants. Um, Right now, I think all of the regional greenhouse gas initiative funding uh, goes to Efficiency Maine already. So we don't want to pull funds from other programs to invest in the Green Bank. Um, we'd like to we'd like to use new funding, um, but that could be an option. Um, personally, I would love to see the Maine Public Employee Retirement System di uh, divest from fossil fuels and reinvest in clean energy in the state of Maine. Um, through the Green Bank, but currently we're not requesting that um, in the in the divestment bill. And I think it probably makes sense uh, to have a few years of track record demonstrate that the main Green Bank is a successful investment option, um, and then try to get the public employee retirement system to invest, you know, three to five years down the road. Um, but that could be an option for funding as well. Um, so this next segment of the presentation is looking at the National Climate Bank or the, na the National Level Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator. Um, and I've, I've borrowed some slides from the Coalition for Green Capital, which is a national nonprofit group that has been helping us here in Maine create the, the Maine Green Bank, but has also been leading efforts for the National Climate Bank. Um, and so the, the key is President Biden's uh, climate goals um, are, are very ambitious and will require a tremendous amount of investment in renewable energy. Um, he set a goal of 100% clean power by 2035 um, and net zero energy by 2050. And um, together those will require approximately $2 trillion in investment um, to achieve the, the climate and clean energy goals that he has set so far. 
and the, and this slide show was put together in November, so it's not looking specifically at the executive orders that he's signed so far, but his commitments on the on the campaign trail. Um, currently, there's legislation. It's actually supposed to be introduced this week um, that will create a hundred billion dollar national clean energy and sustainability accelerator. And they estimate that that will create over 4 million jobs in the first four years um, across a whole array of, of different uh, industry sectors. Um, the, the, bill is, the bill was introduced in 2019. Um, and last year, it passed out of the House of Representatives twice um, as part of larger bill packages that uh, Senator McConnell never introduced in the Senate, so they never came up for a vote in the Senate. Um, but last year, Kamala Harris was one of the co-sponsors of the Senate bill. Um, and, and we know that the Biden administration is supportive of this type of investment. And it will probably be included as part of a larger package of infrastructure investments. Um, but they are they are planning to reintroduce the bill. My understanding is this week, um, and when it passed out of the House of Representatives, both uh, Representative Pingree and Representative Golden voted in support of it. Um, right now, we're pushing to try to get both of them to co-sponsor the bill. We've met with uh, Senator, or we've met with Senator Collins, and we were encouraging her to co-sponsor the bill. Um, I, I don't know if that'll happen yet, but you know it's a stretch. We're trying to push, um, and we have meetings. The Sierra Club has meetings with um, both representatives and uh, Senator King in the next week. Um, so we're going to be pushing them to co-sponsor the bill, uh, among other things. Um, and so trying to trying to develop support for the federal bill to make sure that we have funding um, to support the main the main green bank effort. Um, and it's a pretty simple piece of legislation because essentially it requires an appropriation. Uh, and they've actually, my understanding is they've actually already created the nonprofit shell that will be the National Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator. And so it'll, it'll $100 billion in funding from Congress um, will fund that. And, and then they're ready to go and off to the races um on that front and because of the way that it's structured it doesn't require a major piece of legislation and can probably be passed through the reconciliation process um, so depending on thing where things go with the filibuster and uh you know with the very split senate 50 50 split with kamala harris as the deciding vote um the the reconciliation process would allow them to pass this without needing a 60 vote majority. Um, and so that's a, a, a great option and, and very exciting. We are still trying to get Republican co-sponsors, um, but even without any Republicans, this could still pass. Um, and it will fund, it's, it's the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator, and it will fund a lot of different types of projects, including renewable energy, um, building efficiency, industrial decarbonization, electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging. Um, it will also support regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry, which could be really big in Maine. Um, cross laminated timber could be a big industry in Maine as using our local wood products to uh, essentially store carbon in buildings in the long term. Um, and it can also fund a, a variety of climate resilience projects, um, which could include wastewater treatment plants, roads, bridges. Uh, we're, we're planning for several feet of sea level rise. Um, I think the Maine Climate Council is preparing for up to eight feet of sea level rise by 2100. Um, so that's going to require a lot of investment in infrastructure uh, to, to help make sure that we're ready for for that and the, and the many other implications of climate change in the state. Um, and so it's exciting to have this as a potential source of funding. Um, and similar to what we've 
uh, drafted in Maine, the, the national bill calls for 40% of investment to be made in disadvantaged communities um, to create jobs and lower energy costs in those communities. Um, and the, it'll have a significant impact for frontline communities that are facing the brunt of climate change, um, as well as uh, Native American tribes and uh, low income communities around the country. And the fossil fuel industry has had a, an incredibly disproportionate impact. Um, they, they almost exclusively build fossil fuel infrastructure in low income communities. And, and then if a refinery or a power plant is built in your backyard and your property value crashes. And so then people can't leave because their house is worthless and they have no equity to be able to move somewhere else. And so there's really been a lot of injustice and inequity in the fossil fuel industry from the uh, health impacts and, and the pollution. And so it's very important to help to address that. And, and this is uniquely designed to be able to do that. Um, and, and like I've mentioned, um, this is a proven model. Um, the Connecticut Green Bank has been the most successful over the last 10 or 11 years, um, but there's numerous other green bank type programs ranging from Hawaii to Florida. Um, and, and then also internationally, I, I attended the International Green Bank Summit in New York in 2014 and met the director of the Australian Green Bank and the UK Green Investment Bank. Um, and there's efforts in Germany and Japan and Malaysia and all around the world. Um, and so it's, it's a really well proven model um, that, that we know can be successful both at the national level and at the state level. Um, and from the projections that I've seen, um, if the National Climate Bank is funded at the $100 billion level. Um, one of the big things that the National Climate Bank will do is pass funds through to state level efforts. And so the main green bank could receive $100 million to $200 million in upfront, fi upfront funding from the National Climate Bank, uh, which is why it's so important for us to support um, the, the national level legislation and push our representatives and senators in Maine um, to, to support that so that there's funding for, for the work that we're trying to do in Maine. And there's a couple of things um, that, we, that we can do um, to support the federal legislation and I'll, I'll paste them in the chat. Um, one is that um, I've worked with the Coalition for Green Capital um, to draft a sign-on letter. Um, and we'd encourage you all to sign on in support of the federal legislation. It's asking our two representatives and, and both of our senators to co-sponsor the, the federal bill. Um, and, and so I, I hope that you all can uh, sign on to that and, and share it with others. And then um, Sierra Club has also created an add up campaign um, that will, where the sign on letter, everyone's names get added at the bottom and we can tell them how many people have signed on to it. Um, the add up campaign will send messages directly to your representative and your senators, both senators, um, telling them that you support the bill and asking them to co-sponsor it. So two different ways to have an impact at the federal level. Um, and I'd, I'd encourage you all to uh, sign, sign on to each of those. Um, and, and like I mentioned, the National Clean Energy Accelerator will provide funding, including uh, startup operating funds uh, and capital for state level green banks. The states in green already have an existing green bank entity. Um, and, and Nevada, I, I helped to create the Nevada Green Bank while I was, while I was living in Reno and working out there um, and spent three or four years trying to push that legislation forward. Um, and, and so I'm excited to see Nevada in green on this. And then all the blue states on this map are, have green banks in development. Um, and you'll notice that they're, um, 
they're happening in a lot of uh, purple and red states at this point. South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Missouri, um, Alaska. There's a lot of different states that are that are recognizing that this is a successful model, and it'll help create jobs and it'll help create local economic growth. Um, and so it's not it's not a partisan issue, and it really shouldn't be a partisan uh, bill. It, it, and, and I'm excited to say, I actually, I didn't add this into my slide. Um, we've lined up two Republican co-sponsors for the Maine Green Bank legislation. Um, and so I was really excited to line up uh, a, a representative and a senator at the, at the state legislature in support of this. Um, I think this is the last slide on the federal level Green Bank, um, but this is highlighting some of the different types of programs that already exist with, with the existing state level and local level green banks. Um, and so these types of programs can be replicated in Maine or in other states across the country and, and can work like things are ready to go and, and, can, and can move forward very quickly um, using some of these existing programs. Um, it's really incredible with my experience working with other green banks. Um, there's a lot of collaboration and support within the green bank community. Um, we had the executive director from the Connecticut Green Bank speak at the Maine Green Bank Summit we hosted in June. And we had the chief investment officer from the Connecticut Green Bank speak to the banks and lenders here in Maine. Um, it, and they want other states to succeed. It's a really unique model because it's not competitive. The, the idea is not for it to compete with other local lenders. The idea is for it to crowd in those other lenders and help give them access to new markets that, that they're currently not investing in. Um, so in terms of next steps and things that you can do, um, I'd encourage you all to sign on to the Coalition for Green Capital letter of support and sign up on the Sierra Club add up campaign. Um, the bill has not been released from the revisor's office yet, so we don't have um, a bill LD number and we don't have a date scheduled for the hearing. Um, typically, they provide two weeks notice before the hearing, um, and so we should be able to share that information out once we know. Um, but you can if you if you want to support the main green bank you can start to draft testimony in support of it or or draft a letter to the editor um, to, for the local paper um, in support of it um, and that's something that i'm happy to help with if any of you are interested in in uh, writing testimony or writing a letter of support um, please let me know if there's other groups that you think would want to learn more about this that you could help line up a presentation to um, we, we gave a presentation to the Portland Society of Architects. We've given presentations to bankers and lenders, um, and we're, we're trying to engage as many, you know, a variety of different um, industries across Maine. Um, this can really benefit everyone in Maine, either as an individual investing in efficiency and clean energy in your own home, um, or just through the job creation and the local economic benefit each year, we spend $4 billion importing fossil fuels from out of state. That's $4 billion a year leaving our state economy. And, um, and this transitioning to 100% clean energy can keep literally billions of dollars in our state economy and, and recirculate that here locally, supporting all these other industries in addition to um, just the efficiency and clean energy. So please let me know if there's other groups that you uh, would like to engage with this um, and share it with friends and, or family. Um, here's a couple of additional resources. Um, the Connecticut Green Bank is fantastic. I, I love their annual report. It gives high level overview of the impacts that they've had, but then it gives descriptions of some of their programs and you know, has testimony from some of their uh, the customers that they've worked with, households that they've worked with. Um, and, and so I really enjoy that each year. Um, and the Coalition for Green Capital has a bunch of resources, uh, both for the National Climate Bank and, and for uh, state level things like what we're doing in Maine. Um, 
And so, um, does anyone have any questions for me? I did see one in the chat, David. And the only other um, quick thing I'd reiterate is the add up campaign. Once, once we do have that uh, printed bill number for the state, we can best update folks through that add up campaign as things arise or more information comes. So I, I definitely want to um, encourage you to log on there. But Gary did have a question earlier. Um, do the various CAP CAP agencies in Maine participate in this clean energy effort? Yeah, I, I think that they're involved in uh, the, the weatherization programs for low income households. Um, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I want to say that they're working with like five to 10,000 households a year in terms of weatherization. And there's uh, 750 homes, 750,000 homes in Maine, 550,000 households. Uh, and so if you're doing 10,000 homes a year, it'll take 55 years to reach every house. Um, and also a lot of times with their weatherization, they're limited to about $6,000 per house. So they're just kind of addressing the worst of like the, the worst problems. And it's, it's not a whole home retrofit. It's not, they're often, typically they're doing weatherization. And I know Efficiency Maine has a new low income heat pump program to help uh, fund heat pumps in low income households um, to help them transition off of propane and heating oil. Um, but again, it's going to be a limited number. Like the state of Maine doesn't have the money to be able to spend $5,000 or $10,000 on every single house in the state. Um, so we need to drive in private investment and, and help make the, the funding affordable. But yeah, no, I mean, certainly great work. I support all the things that the, uh, that the weatherization programs and, and cap agencies are doing, um, but it's, is not the full solution. Um, so I see a question, um, where have other state green banks? Oh, here, let me, um, let me stop screen sharing and then we can actually see each other. Um, where have other state green banks gotten their funding if the National Accelerator does not exist yet? Um, so a lot of them in 2010, during the Recovery Act, um, after the recession, or in the middle of the recession, um, a lot of them used a portion of the ARA funding, the what is it, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funding. A lot of them used a portion of that as startup funding. Um, so, like that's how the the Florida program got funded. That's how the Michigan program got funded. Um, I, that was a portion of the funding for Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut used a mix of different things. Um, they received some investment from the state. Like I think in the first few years, the state of Connecticut put $20 million a year into the state green bank. Um, they've also, Connecticut has also tapped into um, Reggie funding um, from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, and Maine has already, Maine is ahead of most states in terms of making sure that the REGI funds are used for efficiency and clean energy. And, and so already those funds are going to um, efficiency Maine for the, for the programs that they run. And then, and then the other thing that Connecticut and other states have used for funding is most electric utilities um, have uh, a portion of the cost that everyone is paying is paying for efficiency programs. And, um, and so Connecticut and other states have used some of the uh, funding from that's collected by the electric utilities that they're required to invest in efficiency and clean energy programs. Um, and, and so that's another location that funding has come from in other states. And again, I think that money is directed to efficiency main. Um, and so they use it for things like rebates on light bulbs. If you're going to Walmart or Home Depot, LED light bulbs are like a dollar a box. And that's in, in part due to the um, electric um, efficiency programs from, from the utilities that Efficiency Maine is directing. Um, and so um, those, are, those are kind of the key ways that the, the other 
existing green banks have been funded that that I'm aware of. Yeah, but that's a great question because yeah, ideally we could do this regardless of having federal funding. Um, but it just seems like it's it's so close. We we can really line up that federal funding. We need to invest in infrastructure. I know there's been a bipartisan push in, in the past few years for an infrastructure bill. Um, and so I think that, that this can be part of a, a larger infrastructure bill to invest in our roads and bridges and airports and, and all that other um, important community infrastructure. Any, any other questions? I, uh, it's in, in the chat, but does any, yeah, does anyone else have any? Yeah, go ahead, Gary. I know you're preparing to um, have individuals testify before a legislature in regards to this uh, LD99. I was wondering if you, uh, or is the legislature uh, amenable to a video, um, say something you want to develop yourself and then get it to the legislature? Is, is there a link for that? Or is that something that an individual could do if they wanted to? Yeah, so a uh, great question. Yeah, so this year, um, I think all the committees are using Zoom. Um, so they're not actually meeting in person at the legislature at all. Um, and I haven't participated in a hearing yet. It sounds like I was talking to someone who's been in several committees and it sounds like every committee <laughs> has slightly different setup. Some are more organized than others. Um, they were telling me that it seems like some committees have never used Zoom before, um, which is kind of hard to believe given that we're nine months into a pandemic and it seems like we've all been using it the whole time. Uh, but they are, they are lining up in person, like the in-person testimony that you normally show up to the committee to provide, they're doing over Zoom. Um, and and I don't I don't think you can pre-record a message, but you but you can do it in person over Zoom if that answers. No, I mean that's great because of the fact that if you was to help me develop some kind of a testimony and I tweak it to my perspective of things uh, and I can line up uh, in the legislature to be participating in the Zoom, then when I announce my name, and I unmute myself when I go ahead and, and read my testimony and at least get it recorded to the legislature that, you know, these people over here in Jay Maine are very much interested in moving forward with this legislation, et cetera, et cetera. So that, mm -hmm. would, that would be a great benefit, I think, for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's interesting because it almost seems like it makes public participation easier, you know, particularly for people up in the county or, you know, Kittery or, you know, th there's a lot of people that have a long drive to get to Augusta. And, uh, and I think, I think it rolled out last session, but they've also made it easier to submit written testimony on the legislature's website, um, where I, I think in previous years, that was a pretty complex process. Um, and now you can do it through the, through the website. Yeah, and I'll put that link in the chat. I have signed up for uh, two committees myself. I've talked to one thus far and um, they are still getting organized, but if you do email or call that committee secretary or um, staff person um, and say you want to testify, they should be able to line you up and they are starting to break you into actual time blocks to be on Zoom. So um, it's, it, it actually, yeah, it could be a great thing for public participation. Yeah, I know I've been to Augusta a few times and sat two hours waiting for a hearing to begin and then it finally starts and then you're waiting another two hours for testimony and uh, it can, it can, you know, it's a full day going to Augusta to give three minutes of testimony for a bill, as probably some of you have experienced. Um, so I see a question in the chat. Um, is Green Bank funding available to businesses of various sizes? And yes. Um, and small businesses are another really important sector that often don't have access to funding. Uh, medium and larger businesses, the you know Walmart and Hannafords have access to all sorts of, of funding and can and can borrow from banks and lenders. And for smaller businesses that don't have a long track record, it can be really difficult. 
um, to, to borrow money even for facility improvements and things like this. Um, and so that's, that's another really important sector that the Green Bank will be working with. Um, there's a separate bill moving forward this session uh, for commercial property assessed clean energy or commercial PACE. Um, and that's an important way of uh, funding efficiency and clean energy projects for businesses. Um, and it, it attaches the loan to the property tax bill. Um, and so it, it's a way of secure, securing the loan, but if you sell the property, it can be passed on to the next building owner. Um, and, and property assessed clean energy is another like well-established program around the country. And um, it's often led by states that have green banks. It's often led by the green bank, um, but there is a separate bill moving forward this session for commercial pace, which, which will specifically help um, businesses. Um, and then is there a sense of timeline for getting the federal legislation through? Um, it's Congress, it's Washington DC, I, I don't know. Um, there's, there's a lot of hope. It's, it, after this COVID relief package that they're discussing now that, that Biden is working on, my understanding is that the infrastructure package is Biden's next priority, um, but I do not have an inside line to the White House or <laughs> to Congress. Um, but the Coalition for Green Capital has been working really hard um, on this. And so it's, it's looking hopeful that it will pass this year. Um, I, can, I can say it's not likely to pass in February, um, but hopefully it would pass by June. But other than that, I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah. Anyone else have any any other questions today? And feel free to unmute yourselves if, if anyone wants to speak. All right. Well, I guess I guess we can wrap up then. Thank you all for for joining us today. Uh, Matt, was there anything else that you wanted to add in? No, just please, um, I, I do encourage you to uh, sign up for that Add Up campaign and um, tell your friends. And I think that's going to be the best way to keep up to date with both the federal legislation and the state legislation. Yep, perfect.